Okay, we're rolling. All right, this is an interview at the New York State Military Museum, Saratoga Springs, New York. It is the 21st of December, 2007, approximately 11 a.m. Uh, inter interviewers are Mike Russert and Wayne Clark. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? John Francis Thorpe. December the 23rd, 1913. Okay, where were you born? Albany, New York. All right. What was your educational background prior to going into service? Second year high school, I quit. Went to work. Okay, when, when did you quit? I was... I was 15 and a half years old and I went to work in the New York Telephone Company. That was what prompted me. I had the opportunity to get a job there, and I thought it was a good, a good place to start. Mm -hmm. So I just did that, mm -hmm. and uh, I don't know to this day if I ever regretted it because it was, we were coming out of the, the depression, of which was uh, very difficult through the young, my younger uh, years. Uh, I also had one thing that I remembered always stood out in my mind. That's where I met Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Oh, you did? On the elevator in the state capitol. I used to have to go over there twice a week. This is when he was governor? When he was governor of New York State. Mm -hmm. And I met him. The guard wouldn't let me on the elevator and the door closed. The next thing you know, the, the door opened right back up about five seconds. He said, come here, son. There's always room for one more, he said. <laughs> so that's uh, uh, the time that I met Mr. Roosevelt. <laughs> did, did you talk to him at all on the way up? No, just that I, uh, he, he was very pleasant with me, mm -hmm. and I couldn't, at the time it was insignificant to me. Right. Because yeah. I Probably too young to even think of that's that. That's right. Yeah. I, here, I'm, I'm, a, <laughs> I'm most concerned that I was was the business I was on, so I wouldn't make a mistake mm -hmm. <laughs> for the phone company, you know. So uh, that was one of my experiences. And uh, now, you worked with the telephone company until you went into service. No, I uh, worked there when I was 18, past 18 years old. And then I uh, went out. The depression was still ha well, having its effect on the mm -hmm. country, and I went out door to door salesman. And I was being quite successful at that, uh, because that was what my father done most of his life as a mm -hmm. salesman. What were you selling? Well, on one occasion, I was selling brushes for the Stanley Brush Company which is no longer in business, I don't believe. Mm -hmm. And uh, another time I was selling some kind of clothing, wearing apparel for women or something, and it was, it was uh, I didn't make out too good at that. <laughs> <laughs> now, when, when did you end up going into service? When I went into service was in 1943. But prior to that, I had been in the CCC's, Civilian so Conservation Corps, right. for six months. And uh, in the meantime, uh, his, uh, Roosevelt was planning on putting the youth of America into better physical condition, is the impression I had at the time. Mm -hmm. and. It was also enlightened to you that they you, they had other plans down the line for you. They had to get you in pretty good shape. Mm -hmm. So in uh, I believe it was in 1938 when uh, the uh, Hitler started plundering a bit in uh, Europe. As far as I can recall. And we knew, as, as a young guy, we knew that sooner or later it was going to 
spread all over. Mm -hmm. Do you remember yeah. where you were when you heard about Pearl Harbor? Uh, I was on Albany Street in Schenectady, uh, attending to uh, automatic hoses, which was a wired music, which was t took the place of the jukebox. And you would put a coin in, and a, an operator in the central office would say, uh, identify yourself, and then say, now what number can I play for you? You know? So she said, Jack, Jack, listen to me. I said, what's wrong? She said, the Japs just bombed Pearl Harbor and it's an awful mess over there. I said, there's what we expected sooner or, you know, in the future. But we figured it would happen with Hitler. Do you know where Pearl Harbor was? Not only that they, what they told me mm -hmm. on, the, on the news. Mm -hmm. what, was your, what were your feelings when you were told this? Well, I... I knew that uh, my feelings was that it'll take a while, but I'm going to be drafted or mm -hmm. uh, be in uniform. And I, I felt, uh, I, know, I, know, I knew that for certain. Now, were you drafted? Then I was drafted uh, in 1943. So you were 30 years old at that time? 26. Oh, 26. 26 years old. And I was drafted. And they were taking out, at that point, uh, anyone that had been pre uh, preferred to, uh, or uh, rejected because of a uh, physical condition. Now they've all been called back up again, and they now they're accepting with mild, mild conditions. They were accepting you, mm -hmm. so. In, in 1943, on January the 1st, I walked out State Street with the group of draftees to the uh, Omni Railroad Station. And I met my wife and, and my father and mother there. You were married at the time. When yeah. did you get married? Uh, early that year. Oh, okay. <coughs> and, uh, my wife was pregnant for him at the time. And so it was about 10.30 in the morning when the train wasn't due for about uh, 11.30. So my father, kind of guy he was, he, he said, would you like a drink, Jack? And uh, so we all had a, a mixed drink at the bar there. And the next thing you know, I found myself on the train going to Camp Upton. So that was where we they sent us out to the different stage, or they can't. That was a staging area and sent us out to the different uh, camps. I wound up in Camp Groover, Oklahoma. And they were training for engineers. Uh, we put basic training in there, and then they some something turned up that they wanted to train us now for jungle warfare, and they sent us down to Louisiana. During our stay in Louisiana, at Camp Oak, Louisiana. Well, we had all the thrills and fears of the snakes down there. Well, we sent back to, uh, to Camp Gruber, and then they determined that we were going to Europe. So we went to uh, Miles Standish Camp, Miles Standish, in Massachusetts, and then from there down to the port of embarkation in New York City on a big giant uh, pleasure ship, we were about 4,000 of us, and we went to North Africa. Now you must have been a single ship then if it was one of the, rather <coughs> than a convoy? We had a, 
of those sub chasers circle our ship all the way over oh, to yeah. North Africa. Mm -hmm. Now, in the meantime, North Africa, the Germans vacated North Africa mm -hmm. and went into Sicily. We landed at, at Oran, Africa. Here's a big black ship, medical ship, with a swastika on the side of it. Hospital ship. That was right, uh, pardon me, right next door, or next to us, in the harbor. We, we were there for uh, two to three weeks, and then we were uh, all steamed up, organizing a convoy to go to Sicily. Now, were you assigned to a unit by now? We're assigned, well, with the 235th Combat Engineers. Okay. Uh, under the, the supervision of the 1108 group is what they call it. There was a, the, another, uh, the uh, 48 Combat Engineers, too. There was two units, and our, we were operating as a, whatever way you want to call it, we always call it a bastard battalion, because we would be assigned to any division that asked for help. Well, anyhow, we first went into Sicily, and the, they stayed, we stayed 24 hours, or overnight, so to speak, in the harbor. Then we were, the next, that night, we went through the Straits of Messina, Past the Rock of Gibraltar, and, and uh, uh, we knew there was going to be some action there. We had to go into the port of Naples. Well, we pulled in, and we were getting strafed and, and uh, dive bombing. But the clown that did it, he hit a hospital ship and dumped that on his side, it was in a harbor, an American hospital ship. Well, I, got, I jumped I got down the side of the ship on a rope, and there was these uh, concrete eagles, uh, three or four of them on the harbor, and they, they were like air, used for airway shelters, made out of cement, and a little, a little hole you climbed in. I, I climbed into one of them, and if I get in there, I was sorry because this, the place had all these uh, civilians in there, and they were scared silly, but the place smelled awful. <laughs> now, do you remember what year and month that was? That was, uh, let's see, uh, 19... Uh, was it still? Four, it was 1943 yet. Okay. And uh, they needed they needed troops badly. So you co your ship collided with a hospital ship. No, we didn't collide. Well, with you it. you sideswiped it. No, the the bombed it. The oh, Germans oh, bombed okay. it and it dumped over. Oh, I see. Okay. And we were right there aside of it. And the the, the uh, that's why I I got off of the ship and that I was on. Mm -hmm. All our equipment was on it. Was your hit your ship hit? No, we didn't get hit. <clears throat> no. And then this uh, that's when the uh, American Air Force start frequently coming over here and pr protecting us. Mm -hmm. So I uh, that was the beginning of our trip up to through southern Italy. You uh, landed in Naples. Naples. <clears throat> Was it um, a hot beach where you landed in landing craft? Or? No, no. We pulled right in with the support of our own uh, support from up in the sky. Mm -hmm. uh, right into the harbor and started unloading the stuff that we did, that we till we got chased away with the uh, German plane, mm -hmm. and, and that's when I took cover for a while. Well, the next thing they told me, they, I heard my name being called out. 
And I, I go to the, uh, the officer and he says, there's your, your truck. Now you got to go up the road until an MP stops you and don't go past him. Because that's where the fight, the, the small arms fighting mm -hmm. is. So I got there and, uh, and all these, they got all the wounded laying around there, the uh, piles of clothes and all blood and everything. <coughs> so I, I think I finally got to the, where the action is. <coughs> Holy man. So we uh, finally got our, our whole unit together, our company. And we got organized. They said, uh, everybody, all the guys, get on the, sh on the back of the truck, the, uh, the squad after squad, you know. Mm -hmm. We had to uh, go up to casino. Now we have a young lieutenant, knew, knew no more than I knew. When you reach the front of, uh, line MP, you are supposed to ask him where you can pull off and bivouac mm -hmm. in the field where it's safe, because that was supposed to be mine clear and all. So nothing would have him do, but he pulls in a uh, among a battery of uh, howitzers, American howitzers. I don't know it, and no, I don't think any of the, guy, the guys know it. I'm parked out in front uh, with a, under a, a net, camouflage net, and they, they call for a fire mission, and I was getting, we were getting hit with the, the flare, the particles of the flare from the gun. <laughs> we were right in front of it and didn't know it. <laughs> and that went on for a, a good hour or two. And, and the next thing I, I got out, well, I had gotten out of the truck and, and crawled under the truck. I had a great habit of getting under the truck. <laughs> At least I felt sa uh, safer there. Mm -hmm. Now, what kind of trucks did you have? General Motor. Uh, well, what size were they, like two uh, and a half? Two, two and a half ton, I, okay. I believe that's what they were. Yeah. Because we had a, we could carry a squad of men, and we also brought equipment, bridge equipment up. Now, at Casino, our job was to, to cross any bomb crater that was too big to fill in, mm -hmm. which this night we were I backed up and I remembered there was a cemetery with a brick wall around it on my left when I'm backing up and the, the guards uh, the guy guiding me said now don't race the don't race the engine and this is one of the occasions I spoke of Here's some water thank you Back your truck up very slow. Let the engine just about idle so it'll move the truck. It was loaded with Bailey Bridge equipment. I got it up there, and the guard, the guard there was at the site says, good, good, stop. Now you can get out of it. So it was quiet, like I said. And they let us start working with the, they let them, the first tr truck, that, the truck that got there ahead of me, they got him unloaded and got us to start putting the bridge together. And I'm still waiting there. And I heard a, a whistle in the air, and I said, oh my God. Well, the next thing you know, it was one of those, the first one I heard was a screaming Mimi. Every time it would fire, they were about the size, or somewhere around the size of a 90 millimeter shell. And every time that one of those would fly, I count them. There was nine. They used to shoot nine uh, in a row and they'd go all over the place. So uh, at this point, I heard the shrapnel flying through the air. I said, I'm getting off my feet. I got under between the two front wheels of the truck. 
Now, I figured the wheels of the, the Jim, Jim truck was quarter inch thick anyhow to steal. Mm -hmm. That was, I figured, was some protection. And you could hear this stuff zing and, and everything when they did. So I had counted up to seven. So this one guy, a uh, friend of mine, well, he was a soldier friend, he said, Boy, you're awful nervous tonight, Torpy. What's the matter? I said, Dominic, get down. So he, the next shell come in, scared him, and he slid beside of me. Now, I know there's only count, there's two more shells going to fire, and that's going to, then they got to reload. This screaming Mimi. Mm -hmm. He slides in the side of me. The next shell hit, and he, he made a noise, and I said, Dad, my, look, when this, when this next shell hits, start crawling. <coughs> I didn't know the man was dead. So I crawled down, it was about a oh, half a city block, we'll say, and I got inside of the cemetery wall, and I laid against the wall. Now, 43 of the guys got a total there uh, that night with these mortar shells and everything. I felt comfortable where I was. So I stayed there until I could hear one of our trucks out there. So I go outside of the cemetery gate. Here's a, a, a Dodge tandem, whatever you call them, truck. And it was filled with guys, all blood and uh, all hit with shrapnel. There was a total of 43 of them. So I said to the lieutenant, he was about 23 years old, something like that, and I said, Sir, Dom Caridi, I think, is up, he got hit, he's hit, wounded, he's a, he was a, laying aside of me. He said, look, and I got all I can do to take care of these men here. And I said, well, can we get anyone to go up and uh, crawl back up and we'll see if we can help them? No, you just go about your business. He was a, a first lieutenant. I had to listen to him. So somebody grabbed me and took me back down to the, the uh, down a few miles of the uh, bivouac area. And I crawled in under a canvas and laid there. And the next thing you know, a lieutenant and a staff sergeant came over, and he, he yelled, "Call uh, private door, private door!" And I said, "Here I am here." He said, "We we come to t uh, talk to you." Not, and one, one of them has a bottle of seven crown whiskey. And I'm, I'm looking at them. And was, they're standing in front of the, the canvas, outside of the canvas. He said, well, do you think you need a, a little shot of anything? I said, no, not, I don't want nothing right now. He said, well, we come to tell you. Uh, you couldn't have done anything to help Caridi anyhow. When you heard him make that noise, he got hit with a piece of shrapnel. He said it took his heart right out, out of his chest. So I said, well, at least I felt if I could have helped them, you know. Mm -hmm. I alerted them. But anyhow, that was one of the heavy experiences we had there at Casino. And we had a few other than that, but that was the heaviest concentration of shell fire that we had got experience to. Like I say, the Germans used to let us <laughs> get situated, working, and then, and then nice and quiet, and then all of a sudden they'd open up on you. Mm -hmm. Now, did you carry any sidearms? Oh, I always had a rifle in my, side, in my truck mm -hmm. and a machine gun mounted on the right hand on the passenger side. Now this kid that got killed was the machine gunner for my truck. He was 18 years old, Johnny Lammers.
That's where that letter, I showed you, give you a letter. Mm -hmm. And he stepped off of the side of the truck. This is the, well, I'm getting ahead of myself here now. Uh, we went off to the, the, they pulled us back from the casino front and sent us over to the, to the left flank by between the casino front and the Adriatic Sea, I believe it was. Now, the 5th Army and uh, all the, uh, was Affili or the affiliation of the or with the uh, allies of ours, all lined up in an entire front across Italy. They came around. He said, "Make sure your bags or your your barrack bag is packed. We're going at eleven o'clock tonight, and our first assignment is when we come to the river, we got to get a pontoon bridge across." strong enough to carry a, a Sherman tank. That was our first assignment. They, they put us, everything on the trucks was loaded, with the, the squad of men on it, we take off. We get up to this uh, spot in the river, uh, pull the truck back in the building so they can't be seen. You know? So we did that. The squad, the, the, the guys come down off of the truck, go down where the equipment is, start assembling those large pontoons, uh, big, you know, they, they look like a big boat. Mm -hmm. and they, now how were they carried down? They, how did you carry them? They used to carry, uh, there was handles on the sides of them. Mm -hmm. You know, and like six men could carry one of them, mm -hmm. and they would uh, start one and clamp the. Uh, uh, it would go out, and they'd, they'd have this tread. It would fit in. They were like uh, holes, like that. You know, metal, metal on the end of the thing, uh, the uh, the tracks. They would uh, put a big pin through them. Then they slide that one out and put another pontoon there. And that, that went on until it crossed the river. Well, finally, we got crossed. Now, when you weren't truck driving, what were you doing? What was your job when they built the bridges and so on? I had to stand by and see that the, I, could, I could take the men back out of there in a hurry. If, if, if it were possible, mm -hmm. which it wasn't, as a rule, it wasn't. But uh, we got the, uh, they got this night, they got the bridge across the river, and they got a couple of Sherman tanks across. But before that, they told us, uh, just before we got into that, they told us, set your ears for the, for the loud noises tonight, there's going to be a, a lot of artillery, and at 11 o'clock sharp, 2,400 guns let go at once. And you never seen such a mess. When we got across that river, there was dead lay in every place you looked. And I started feeling sorry for the Germans. They were they hammered the living hell out of them. No matter where they went, they got hit. We. <laughs> They had a, a, a holes dug in the side of the hill to protect themselves from us. They, they weren't even safe in there because the, the artillery was so intense. So that, the American artillery was deadly once it got organized. Ah. We, <laughs> now, we broke through and we, we, we had uh, highway battles all the way up to uh, a small area. What uh, they uh, the only way I ever remembers where the show organized was pulled to Italy, and then we drove them back out of there 
and our outfit was relieved of duty temporarily. So I'm, I'm sitting under an olive tree about 11 o'clock in the morning, and the staff sergeant come, or the buck sergeant from all headquarters come over and said, "Do they want to see you in the in the headquarters?" I said, "What do they do now?" He said, "Nothing. They want to see you." So I went over, and he says, uh, the "Captain says, John, he said, it isn't any no no member of your family's in trouble." I thought right away, I had two other brothers in combat, and I, I was, were they in Europe? They were in uh, one was uh, one was in Europe, one was in the South uh, uh, the islands in the Pacific. South Pacific. The one in the one in uh, Europe, unbeknownst to me, had already been hit. It was in a hospital in uh, England, but they they said no. There's no no. We have no news for you of that, of that nature, but you come back here right after Chow, and the truck is going to take you over to the theater. No, I don't know what it's all about, but I did what I was told. After we had Chow, I went over. I went to the uh, back to the CP, and, and he uh, the truck pulled up as he said, and there was. A half a dozen guys on it. You should get up in there. You're, you're going over to a theater. I go over and he said, "You're auditioning for a show." So <laughs> I auditioned and was accepted. And he said, "Now this is going to be a two-hour show, and you're going to have a, a number of different things to do during this course of the show, the program." So he said, uh, we want to hear you sing one more time. So I started to sing again. He said, yeah, yeah, we, 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 got, we, we know what we're going to do with you. So I found myself in, in uh, one of the uh, features of the show. <laughs> now, have you ever been in show business before? No. <laughs> now, if you want to show those pictures, they... Oh, this this was a, uh, a a comedy skit with all the cast of the show participating in it. Mm -hmm. Now, are you in that picture? I am someplace on one end or the other, but I I I, I wouldn't know which end I'm on here. I would I don't know if I'm no I'm not in that one there. Okay. Okay. How, How about it? is that you in the back? No, that's a uh, that's a trumpet player, or uh, no, he's a comedian. He was a comedian by the name of Jack Keating from New York City. But this is a picture of me singing center stage. <coughs> the George M. Cohen routine with the the Fifth Army Jazz Band playing behind me. Now, what were you singing? Do you remember? Yankee Doodle Dandy, Grand Old Flag, and Mary. Oh. We sang the, the medley, or the all three, and uh, the, uh, I don't know about the, those are about the same, I believe. Now this was called, was the name of this the Bypass to Berlin? That is the okay. title of the, the okay. stage show. And, and did you say, who was it directed by? Ted Post, who, direct, uh, he also, when he came home, he directed Gunsmoke and he directed uh, Clint Eastwood and, and hmm. Clint Eastwood to this day says he's the one that made him. Hmm. Ted Post that uh, I never experienced anything like that, uh, people directing you in a, in a show. So naturally I used to get upset when they start yelling, <laughs> rubbing her head. And then I realized after going through it for a while, what it was all about. It was something new to me. I never did it before, and it was strange. So the show lasted three and a half months. We, we uh, put the show on in several of the better theaters in Italy, different 
said he's offhand, I couldn't even think of some of the cities. Now, did you get to the, meet any celebrities at all? Now, during the course of the second night, the guests, after the show, uh, these people all came backstage and they were all the guests, or all the uh, actors and actresses out of the a stage play, a British play, I think it was, a Paris or Wimple Street or something like that. And what was her name again? I can't remember. They were outstanding movie actors and uh, uh, yeah. then on the second week of the show, we had a guest stars, two of them, out of the USO, two women. One was a singer and tap dancer, and one was a uh, played the fiddle and tap dance. And we uh, we had a, a great night that night. Our colonel come backstage after the show was over, and he says, "John, come here a minute." And he uh, he, he says, "I don't know if he that big." Here's a quart of Seagram 7 if you're going to have a little party backstage. We all had these private rooms back in the theater. Mm -hmm. And now we're, now we're like, we're, we think we're big shots. <laughs> <laughs> so anyhow, that, like I say, it lasted three and a half months from different theaters. And we had a, a big army truck with the big sign on the side of it, a uh, show of... Uh, Bypass to Berlin and where it was going to be shown. We put it on for the Air Force and we put it on for just about every everyone in the sector there. And then we so we hit Luke Antley and they were going to continue on and uh, they uh, they were trying to get uh, the Fifth Army to send us back on a bond drive to New York with the show. And uh, it was rejected because the main, the uh, invasion of the mainland had started, and the manpower was needed in that side of the world. So that was the end of the show, right there in Luca. And uh, the only thing I did after that to to that stood out in my mind was we were all called on to give a, a pint of blood or a unit of blood because the casualties in Europe were so heavy. So we all did that. And we didn't, uh, we didn't move again out of that area. Uh, oh, we went, we went to, uh, out of Florence, at least, we, we went again on the on a, uh, <coughs> offensive uh, north. And we chased the Germans back up into the mountains, up in Lake Guardia. And uh, Lake Homo and Lake Guardia. And the 10th Mountain Division was brought up to, to take the pressure off us. So in the meantime, I, the lieutenant called on me with the jeep to, if I would drive him. I had to drive him back down for payroll returns or something. I was about 10 miles back behind the line. Well, I took him back. And coming back up, we, got, we spotted a German, which was a German warehouse. We go over, and it's, it's an American-occupied uh, warehouse now, with all German prisoners of war. <coughs> taking care of it. So we go in and the lieutenant fills my musette bag with vermouth and, and cognac and cigarettes and cigars, whatever he could grab off the shelf. So we knew we were going back up where there was a little action yet. So he started nipping on the bottle of vermouth. Well, I had a couple with him. So we get up near the 
on the highway on the right on the right side of Lake Guardia, going north. And he said, I think it's time I drive for. I said, Lieutenant, I'm used to it. Because I've been driving in the blind with no lights since I've been here. You had no lights, no, no kinds of lights, but the blackout lights. It, it, but up the front you couldn't even use them. And and then you had the uh, the windshield was down and covered with the canvas. So I said, All right, you're pulling your rank on me, sir. I got out. Got him around the other side, and he got behind the wheel. <coughs> we must have been about three miles. Jesus, he runs into a knocked out 88 gun in the bar, went right over my shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> I said, you're going to kill me, sir. <laughs> Shut up, he said, I'm hurt too. He didn't get hurt, the devil. <laughs> But he backs up quick and he cuts the wheels and he goes over to uh, uh, the rear end swings to the right and the highway was three foot tall higher than the than the, the drainage ditch. He goes off of there and pin, pin, tips over and pins me under the jeep. <laughs> I'm laying there and I can't get out from under the jeep. And the uh, and I, the 10th Mountain Division was bivouacked off up on the side of the hill and they heard somebody moaning and it was me. They come down and lift the jeep off me. <laughs> and when I stood up, the blood circulation was cut off. I'd been cut off so long I fell down. Well, I said, I'll be all right. He says, the medic says, uh, what, is your leg feel all right? I said, yeah. The other medic says to him, they've been drinking. <laughs> he smelt the stuff on it. Now, they were pretty foxy about it, though. They took the musette bag where all the stuff was, and they took it up the hill with them. And they left us sitting there. And in the meantime, they notified our outfit to come and get us, you know? Mm -hmm. But they stole my, my musette bag from the booze. <laughs> Oh my God! We then the next day we uh, I had a, I was driving a jeep again and we went drove up to the uh, foothill of the Alps, which was just at the end of the lake. As I recall, the Germans had all a whole division surrendered in the side of the mountain there, where all our rifles and all our equipment was laying there in a pile, and they had surrendered completely. So at least we didn't have the no more fighting in Italy. But then they take us back down to Florence a few days Italy. And uh, we could get anything we want, beer or anything we wanted. It was a staging area. I said, I wonder uh, well, maybe we're going home. Jordan Hill in, in Leghorn, Italy, or Livorno, whatever they call it. Uh, get full field pack and everything. Your barracks bags, your rifles. When he said your rifles, I know then we wasn't going home. We boarded the ship. It was a one of those fast, like a big yacht. It could hold about 3,000 or 3,500 personnel. We left Leghorn down to, to the Panama Canal, to the Panama Canal, all the way down to Manila. Hmm. But while we were seven days out on the ocean, they dropped that first atomic bomb. And that was an answer to a prayer because we were slated for the invasion of Japan and we didn't know it. They gave us all new recruits for, to replace the ones we lost. And we were, what was left of us was we were going to take that, go in the invasion. So we were in Manila for a, 
a few days and they popped, uh, dropped the second bomb and the uh, Japs surrendered. The next thing you know, I found myself on a freighter ship headed back for the States. Now, uh, I want to ask you two questions. Prior to the dropping of the bombs, do you remember how you heard about the death of President Roosevelt? Uh, <coughs> let's see. We, uh, we were staged in, in a staging area in Manila. And I think it was somewhere while we were there that, yes, that, that, uh, no, no, it was before that. Mm -hmm. It was before that because, uh, they announced, it come over, it come over to uh, ship radio. Do you remember how we, you... We were seven days out mm -hmm. when, uh, when the bomb was when 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 the Truman ordered the bomb to be dropped, do you remember how you felt? I mean, you met him once. How, how did you feel when you? Well, I thought he was a remarkable man, mm -hmm. and he had a brilliant mind. It's a shame that he he, he couldn't last to see the the end of it. Mm -hmm. But I say, in my, uh, to, without fear of contradiction, he was one of the greatest men that, that ever. Drew a breath of air. He uh, he had also Churchill was a great man, and uh, he said we were going to have turkey for Thanksgiving. When we were only over in Italy, we had turkey. And everything he said, for every tank you put on the battlefield, we'll put ten. And when he had the the industry of America going real good. We did just that. How did you feel um, with the dropping of the bombs and, and the end of the war? I felt bad for the poor civilians, but they all seemed to have a hatred for us there. So and, and they, they said that they had the kids with sharp sticks, uh, pointed instruments to stab us with if we did invade the nation. Mm -hmm. They, they had all this, we had all this figure of things told to us, so we had enough to think about, don't worry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Once you got back to the States, uh, where did you go from there? Well, I, I come home, or uh, um, was it Marchfield in California, we got off the ship in L.A. And that was an awful journey back home. The ship hit and got into these uh, land squalls out here, whatever they call them, the ship almost broke in two. There were several of them had split in two in the Pacific Ocean. And the ship we were on was a, one of nine mile, a, a nine knot a, an hour thing. Or, and it was getting bounced all over. Everybody was seasick on it. And. Uh, Finally, we got into L.A. and they, the first thing they gave us was a steak dinner. And then the next day they said, anybody in the East Coast who wants to get home in a hurry has to fly. And I never flew in my life. <clears throat> and you're flying on a C-47. Twenty men at a time. Well, I said, "Okay, I'll fly. I'll go." And and you know, they had, the planes were full because everybody was anxious to get back home. So he, <laughs> uh, I get on that ship, right? 747, or not 747, but what do you call it? C-47. C-47. And it was the most horrible experience I ever had in my life. When that thing took off, you think it was going to fall apart. And all the way up, and, then, and, and coming from the west coast to the east, we had to land about seven, six or seven times, different cities. Mm -hmm. And when it take off, 
the wings looked like they were wobbling, everything else. Well, I said, if it gets us home, that's all I'm anxious to do, get, get back to the coast. Well, uh, <laughs> then I got, when I did get home, I didn't know where to, I didn't, I was all confused. He was with his mother. Well, this is the first time you saw your son, right? Yeah, well, I see him when he was a, a, uh, okay. a little bit of baby for mm -hmm. three or four days. Mm -hmm. When uh, they gave us a seven-day furlough from Gruber before we went. Oh, before you went overseas. Yeah. Okay. And so we, out of that, I have four, maybe five days we, when you take out the transportation, you know. And I got a... Uh, Oh, oh, the train, the train pulled into Troy. And uh, a Boston Normandy train from, from, uh, where the hell is, or, uh, Miles Stant, not Miles Stant, he showed, that, oh, Fort Devons, Devons Mass. They sent me back there because now, now that comes the time the draft board wants to take a responsibility for your draft and everything. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'm uh, legally a representative of Massachusetts and also New York because of the months that I was back home in, in, uh, before I was drafted in New York State. <laughs> Anyhow, unbeknownst to me, Massachusetts sent me a check for three hundred dollars, muster now pay. So I asked, I go to, I go to an official, and I ask about. It. He said, No, you're entitled to that. He said, Here's your dates. And the state, and, and, and New York State was given two hundred and fifty. So I get a check from them. And I said, There's something wrong here. And they said, No, you're, they're yours. <laughs> I didn't want to get in trouble. <laughs> Anyway, I got off the, before this all took place, I got off the train in the, the railroad station, I got in Albany from Troy, and I crossed, it, uh, crossed Broadway and uh, there's a ta tavern ever in the name of Thrifty Meads. So I, I said, I, I'm going in there first. I sit there down at the table and beer was a dime a glass, I guess. I had two or three glasses of beer and I said, no, would you call me a taxi? And I got the army boots on you. <laughs> so I said, we just got up in Central Avenue. I knew they were in that vicinity someplace. I get in Central Avenue. Stop at my Tom McCann's shore for me, will you please? I went in there. To get I said, give me a pair of brown shoes or sandals with you or something. I get these boots off. And the guy busted out laughing at me. So now, I, now I'm, I'm going to try to find them. And Bradford Street was strange to me. I didn't know. So I walked over and started asking direction, lugging the barracks bag on my back. And they told me, one block over and take your right, and you go up in the middle of the block, number 58. I ring, I ring the doorbell, and his mother came to the door, and she, oh my God! <laughs> <laughs> that was after two, two and a half years. When were you discharged? When? When, yes, sir. 1946. Uh, I believe it was April the 46th. I think it was around, it was around there somewhere because there was still snow around in, in, the, in the city of Albany. And uh, from then on, it was just a matter of like uh, not wanting to move, just sit, sit at the kitchen table and talk. Did you uh, make use of the GI Bill at all? Never. How about the 5220 Club? I drew that for 
maybe a month or so. Mm -hmm. That's about all. I got a nine with the lady, uh, the, the question, the woman questioning me. When I first went there, said something about uh, asked me uh, too many questions. I thought, and uh, I said, "Pardon me, lady. If this is going to cause a big problem, I just assume not bother. Twenty dollars. I just come back from crawling around halfway around the world, sometimes on my belly, and you're giving me an argument." One of the supervisors heard me speaking to her. He came over and he said, well, Sir, what's wrong? And I explained to him. He said, he said, What are you asking him all these questions for when you know his circumstances? You know? That was the end of that. So I drew uh, two checks that week. I had two, one coming to give me two. And I think I drew about four or five more, that's all. Mm -hmm. now, in the meantime, my partner, my buddy, was in Walter Reed Hospital and they, they had him pretty well put back together. He was all shot up in North Africa. And I, I get a job in a post office sorting mail. The, uh, he got released from, uh, from uh, Walter Reed Hospital. He comes up and finds my father and my brother, who was also shot up bad, and he, he was at uh, home. And they come looking for me down in the post office. I heard the voices talking behind me, and there they are, the supervisor let them in. And he says, Do you, uh, my, my my friend says, do you want to stay here, Jack, or do you want to we'll go out tonight, or you want to wait to get through work? I said, no, I don't like this job anyhow. I was eating dust all night, you know, from the mail mail bags. So we, my father, my brother, my part, my who later on was my partner, and myself, we went out. And we, we went around the city of Albany, had a little a little get-together throughout the night. Then my friend says, Shaq, he said, let's go on business. Well, I said, I, I got a corner we can use. My uncle owns it, but I said, it's empty. But we don't have any money. Now, we didn't use the GI Bill of Rights as you brought it. Mm -hmm. My brother said, I got a thousand dollars I'll loan you for a beginner's. <laughs> so, I said, Johnny, if you think we can do it, we'll do it. This guy, name was Johnny Itzo, uh, a little 120 pound Italian guy with enough guts for 10 men. He, how he got shot up so bad, he. he he threw a, he jumped up and threw a grenade at a machine gun in Italy, or in uh, North Africa. And when he did, the last burst of that machine gun before the grenade hit, caught him across the uh, groin and shot part of his hip off. And he, uh, he laid there till the uh, litter bearers come and picked him up. And they're walking by a, de a dead German, a couple of dead Germans, and he said, hey, let me down the side of that guy. Said, what do you want to do? That? That's the son of a bee that took my ring and pen, or my pen and pencil. And the guy said, why is that so important? He said, because a friend of mine gave it to me going away. That was me. I gave the pen and pencil to him when he went. And anyhow, we get back to the, the, the business venture. We took the thousand dollars. There was a counter in the place. We had to take all the paint off of it and get it back to the wood so we could stain it and varnish it. And we made a, a bar, or same as the same counter, but more like a bar then. 
and we got a beer license, and we had a, 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 a co automatic coffee maker, and what, we, we didn't have no furniture to sit on for, for, for the table. We got a hold of some tables, but we didn't have no furniture. So we went to the barber shop, the two of us, to get a haircut, and the two, two Italian boys run the barber shop, they're friends of ours. And by the time we get through getting our hair cut, the one barber come out from the back room and he, he said to Johnny, here, put that in your pocket. And Johnny looked at it, it was a $500 bill. What's that for? Buy some chairs, will you? <laughs> you can't sit down in your place, he said. <laughs> so then, from then on, we were uh, off to a, a very successful business without sure. the, without the GI Bill of Rights. So you ran, ran a tavern. We had then pretty soon we got the liquor license, and we had, but our business was basically food. Oh, okay. We concentrated and kept it that way mm -hmm. because we didn't want to put up. With How long were you in business? Well, he died when I was, before I was 62, uh, quite a while ago. And I straightened out with his wife and his family, you know. I had a, we had, a, him and I had a joint account that said to either, or their, mm -hmm. you know, whoever survived was their money. Well, it wasn't a lot of money, but her sh The kids, we're going to stop, we're going to... Okay, we're rolling. Okay. What was the name of your business? Well, we opened up uh, uh, this small place which is called Jack's Lunch. And the break we had was the, uh, a, a city block up north of us was the unemployment insurance office, the, uh, where they processed all the checks and everything. So we had all those people there on their coffee breaks twice a day, their lunch. And they always had overtime workers. And we always got the benefit of that. Because they uh, give us their slip and we turn them into the state paid us. But we found that we didn't need no money from the GI Bill of Rights. The only thing it would have given us a more, a better furniture and a better, mm -hmm. a better looking place. Mm -hmm. So we were there a short while, and uh, well, I say short while. We were there over a year in this little corner on one side of the, and the building across the street on the cor other corner was a building I was born in, in 1913, upstairs. So, it was just a coincidence, a man come down that knew me from the time I was a kid, and he said, John, he says, that building there, a friend of mine is trying to sell it, you know him, he's, Mr. Corbett's trying to sell it. And I said, I don't, we don't have that kind of money yet. He said, look, he said, I'm a, on a board of directors in the bank. You got that kind of money. And this is the way he spoke to me. So he said, you want to buy it? It's yours. No down payment, nothing. $13,500 for that and a house in the back. Well, they're getting a the rent from two flats back here and the rent the rent from three flats here, and we're going to convert the, the corner where it was a residence to a, a business place. And we opened up on, uh, we did that, it took us a few weeks, quite a few weeks. Uh, we All the neighbors, friends of ours, would come and help us paint, varnish, uh, put floor down, put build the new party, everybody helped us. And the next thing you know, came the time to move over the, to the new place, they all showed up, 
and cardboard cartons carried all our supplies over there. We had all our new refrigerators and everything in there. And from then on, we went a total, uh, the, the business lasted a total of 32 years. Hmm. I kept going after Johnny passed away. And uh, at 62, I said, I'm going to apply for Social Security while well, like I'm still able to walk, you know? Mm -hmm. and like, what was it? Oh, now, yeah. then, while I'm in business, this young man that I met as 14 years old in Luca, Italy, we're sitting at our kitchen table upstairs, we're having our wife and the kids, and we're having, uh, well, you were 14, right? Yeah. And now, he, had, he had met Peter when he was about 14. Exactly. And so the phone rings, and the mother, my, my wife says, it's for you, Jack. And I says, oh, Jay, who's this now? I, right away, you figure something wrong. Uh, uh, this is the telephone operator from New York City. I have a man here by the name of Peter Mush. Master, how do you pronounce that? Peter's last name. Master Sheedy? Something like that. Anyhow, he says he wants to know if you're John Thorpe that he met in Italy, in Luca, Italy, during the war. <laughs> and I, <laughs> I hadn't heard from him only at uh, New Year's Eve. I'd get a, or, or for New Year's, I got a, a, a little letter from him. Mm -hmm. uh, Hard, like. Sure enough, it it was him. Now he has uh, had a he's 19 years old or 20. Uh, he graduated from Florence University, and he uh, I got this job with the uh, USS Steamship Lines. They export and import back and forth. From Italy, and he was here to get him to make arrangements for an assignment of frozen chicken from Chicago. The next day, the next day he's up there. He come up on train, and we told him from how to get from our house to the from the railroad station. And then these guys took over. My sons took over, and they took him every place. Football game, our style of football. Mm -hmm. He was used to soccer, you know. But he he he, he was a sweetheart of a guy. Gee, what a mm -hmm. what a nice person. So he went and visited him this year, which was quite a thrill. Mm -hmm. This is a, a picture of the villa where they stayed during the if war. If you could hold this up like this, Wayne can focus on this. This is where, uh, where I and this. Room right here. I I slept on the floor for uh, with a couple of buddies for about two weeks, and this was the young man I was just speaking of. Uh, they lived in Luca all their life. Their grandmother was there, and the mother and the father, and now they're all uh, they've all passed away. And he is also a grandfather himself at this time. Mm -hmm. So. Okay, I've known her for a whole okay. generation. That, you can put that down there. How, how do you think your time in the service had an effect on your life? Well, I, uh, I picked up a bacteria of some kind, an intestinal thing, and that they have no way of relating what, where I got it or how I got it. Somewhere in Italy from the, either the dead laying around or uh, there were dead animals and dead people, and <laughs> it was an awful mess. But uh, I had, I got a, a hemorrhage. Now this is in 19... Uh, 47, a little over a year after I was home. The VA hospital in Normandy was built. It was staffed pretty good at the time. 
They, uh... I got me in there and they, started, they put blood on me right away because I lost so much. At 2, 2 .30, 3 o'clock in the morning, they come in and move me onto a, an operating table and told me that they had to, it's an emergency operation. They've called my wife and they're going to try to do it the best they can. And he said, what do you think, John? I said, I'm in your hands. That's all I could say to him. I didn't have the strength to hardly talk. So you didn't have to get shot to get sick from the, right. from the Army. So I, during the course of the operation, it took a total, total of eight units of blood. And I come out and I survived. So about nine months or 11 months later, I had a reoccurrence of emergent again. Now they get me up there and the same thing, go through the same procedure. You, uh, old blood, try to keep me alive. This young, this young uh, sur uh, surgeon so John, we're going to have to operate on you again in another emergency. Apparently, we didn't get what we were after. But this time, it's going to be a different operation. It's going to be more painful if you survive. But he said, you have no choice. You have to be operated on. I said, there So this was a result of some kind of bacteria infection you picked up in and Italy? It was on the back of my stomach. Now this time they go through my back and come around and take two ri three ribs out, push my heart out of the way to get at the back of my stomach. And all the time <laughs> I'm, I'm so I'm, I'm, I'm weak and, and they're, they're doing everything to, to get me to respond, you know. So they they say they thought they had a they, they severed a, a nerve, they call it a vagus nerve, or vag, vega operation or something. From that day on, uh, through a period of about six or eight weeks, I was in severe pain. And I was on my feet trying to walk and eat and try, trying to get work, back to work. And my, uh, my partner was carrying most of the blunt of it, you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, I started to feel my strength. I, I went from 120 pounds back up to 145, and the doctors were very happy about that, that I was re my system was responding. And what you see now is what the result of it was. Now I'm uh, be 94 in two days. And I'm still here. So the second operation must have done it. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much for your interview. <laughs>